This morning we'll be in the third block of five discourses in Matthew. The last discourse was on mission. Remember the commission of the, the 12, the apostles? This section is covering the kingdom. And in this, in this chapter, there's a, a great Jewish number of parables. The number seven, to completely describe the kingdom. So the first one, just to break it down for you, the first one is an introduction. That's where we'll be in today. And when you see those phrases, the kingdom of heaven is like, is like, is like, is like, is like, those are where you find the other parables. Just, just kind of doing some Bible teaching in the midst of this. I know not everyone here is new to the Bible, so maybe this will help guide you. That's my hope anyway. So we'll start in verse 1 of chapter 13. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. He's getting ready to teach like a rabbi. Verse 2, and great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables saying, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, and when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Um, so this isn't the first parable that Jesus has preached, but it is the first time in the New Testament where the word parables is used. What is a parable? It's just an ordinary story to illustrate a truth. And if you, if you pay attention to Jesus' parables, he's teaching about the kingdom based on the parable, but you can also tell who he's talking to because he's using things that apply to his audience. So we can tell who his audience is through that. This was in Capernaum. Capernaum is a fishing, was a fishing and agricultural town. Uh, about 1,500 people. So just picture Hartley. Not a bunch of rich people. In fact, 94% of people in that ancient Roman time were like peasants. So the other percent were the, were the wealthy and they were the landowners. So these weren't the people who owned the land. They were the people who worked on the land. This is where Capernaum, where Peter was called from, if you remember, in, in the boat, and, and Matthew who's writing. And keep in mind the context. This is where Jesus has already performed miracles if you go back and read, he has already taught about the kingdom. So when verse 10 comes on, it's coming out of the heart from the disciples that it seems a little strange that Jesus is teaching in parables. Verse 10 says, and the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has to him more will be given and he will have abundance, but whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because they don't understand. So the question is, well, why are you speaking to them in parables Parables are a little difficult to understand. Wouldn't you preach to them something more clear? Like give them a, a, a clear description of what you're talking about. And then make it less clear for us because we, you know, we're going a little bit deeper. 
Well, it, it's, because, it's become less clear to who's listening for a specific reason, and the scripture shows us this. So it's not that Jesus is being mean. It's not that he's trying to make it harder for certain people to understand the kingdom. Jesus came to bring the kingdom, to preach the kingdom. Remember, Jesus did not show up. He's not showing up to the crowd, and the first thing he's doing is saying, okay, a sower went out to sow. I don't, maybe we, we think that, but it's not, that's not what's happening. He has already taught them, not in parables and in parables, but things about the kingdom. He's also presented the kingdom in, in not only in word, but in deed, right? We remember that from a few weeks ago. So we often think when Jesus says, well, hearing they don't hear and seeing they don't see, maybe it means that only his special disciples could understand. Kind of like saying, okay, you guys over here, I'm going to give you all the secrets of what's going on. But you, I'm going to give you something really out there that you're never going to figure out just to laugh at you. What it comes down to is what we are interpreting or seeing when we hear the words, um, what it means to hear and see, or hearing they will not hear, and seeing they will not see. And that'll tie right into the parable. So Jesus explains the reason. So I don't, we don't have to guess because it's right here. Matthew 13, 14. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. So the prophet Isaiah saw this back then. He saw the people of Israel growing dull. And the reason that they grew dull the reason that they stopped hearing is simply because they rebelled against God. They had been warned over and over again. It was tiring for the prophets. The reason they're not hearing is because of a lack of obedience. So that means that it is the people who close their eyes. So after this, Isaiah asks, well, how long is this going to go on? How long are they going to be dull? How long are they not going to hear? How long are they going to be blinded to your truth, Lord? And you read on and you go to chapter 7. What happens in chapter 7? What answer comes to us there? The prophecy of Emmanuel, Jesus coming, when the kingdom is brought. Jesus is speaking to them in parables because they rebelled. So for the ones who didn't rebel, well, if you understand this, guess what? You're going to understand even more. And for those who are rebelling, this is going to get, it's going to get more confusing to you. Why did they rebel, though? Why? Why would they not? They just spent all that time. Look, what Jesus did these miracles. He, like, healed leprosy and declared how... This kingdom is operating pretty clearly. Well, the answer is in the parable, and it's coming. It's in the soils. So Jesus explains now what the parables meant, and we're starting off with how the message of the kingdom of, of heaven is received, how it's received before he goes into the parables of what it is. What kind of kingdom were they expecting? A political reigning kingdom they were expecting to be the ones persecuting, right? They weren't expecting to be the ones persecuted. We thought we were going to... So, uh, so here's how the message is received. And it's sad to me that three quarters of, of these, these soils, and it's, it's four, which is another... That's another completion thing there, but three out of four do not. Only one is the good soil. So let's get into it in verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, 
the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart, this is what was sown along the path. So number one is hardened because it's a footpath and it was hardened. There was no cars back then. A press down, and I'm not, I am not a farmer. So if I'm wrong, you just correct me, but it's, I'm just using what I have. A press down road is no place to plant seed. It's packed down, try to plant seed on a sidewalk. I I think of growing up close to the big city, um, being in New York City and throwing, you know, seeds on the pavement. And uh, what happens when you do that? Pigeons within seconds, right? They're waiting there. Where's, where's the, the moron who's going to throw seeds in the middle of this place for us to just invest this part of the sidewalk and cause all kinds of problems? Um, so it's a feeding frenzy, and we don't have to wonder who the birds are because Jesus is explaining it. It's the evil one. It's Satan. He does not want people to receive the message of the kingdom. And wherever the... And, I'm sorry, just to start, the the sower is, it could be Jesus, it could be whoever's preaching the the message, and you see evidence of that in verse 19. So it's it's who is bringing the message in this parable. So wherever the gospel is being preached, guess what? There's pigeons waiting to snatch it away from hardened hearts. So Satan loves to be in our services. Now a hardened heart like this that's not, there's, there's no growth happening. It's, it's, it's there and it's gone. It's in one ear, out the other. A heart like this could see miracle after miracle, sign and wonder. It's nothing's going to, it's not going to do any good. It's just, it's hard. The only way out, the only way out of a hard heart is Repentance. There has to be a change. So that's number one, hardened. Number two is rootless. Verse 20, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or affliction or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. It's hard to plant plants in rocky Soil, right? And rocks. I mean, you'll see, you'll see stuff, but it's not, the, you know, the roots aren't going to go deep. Uh, in ancient Palestine, there were parts under the fields where there was limestone. And the limestone holds moisture, and it holds heat. So the seeds are going to grow pretty fast, But when they run out of that moisture that's held in that limestone and the sun comes out, they're going to wither away because it's not deep. What is the sun? Jesus tells us what it is. It's tribulation, affliction, and persecution. And when that happens, when that sun comes out, what happened to the joy? There was joy at first. So simply this is someone who understands this message, and they believe. But they're not able to stand when suffering comes, call it affliction or tribulation, and surely not persecution. The reason for that is they were excited about the blessings. They were excited about, well, it would be the Christian who is making Jesus Savior, but not Lord. And there is a difference. Isaiah 44, 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord, who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. I have some original language up there. Just, we can just look at the words. I'll start with redeemer. 
deliverer, kinsman, saving us from harm. Uh, there's also Hosea 13.4. I don't have it up there, and I'm not good at the Hebrew pronunciation, so I'll just tell you what it means. It's to deliver, to give, to place. Those are all the things. They're, they're great. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. He saved us. Let's look at the Lord word. Adonai, master, possessor. Uh, Kurios in the Greek, the one who rules your heart, who you have given control of, of your life. Do you see the difference? One is what you're receiving, and the other is what you're laying down for. Many people worship him as Savior alone. I'm forgiven, I'm going to heaven, I'm blessed. I have treasures waiting for me, stored up in heaven. I receive his power. Those things are true, but all that is based on what you receive from the cross. And if that's the case, if, if, if it's only Savior and not Lord, which we'll get into when you're you're going to be like rocky soil when suffering comes. When hard things come, affliction, the ones who were amped up about Jesus at the start will fall away. I call it the sugar crash Christianity because you get, you're amped up about it and, wow, I'm forgiven and this, this is powerful and it is powerful. I'm not limiting it. But then, then suffering comes in your life. Then hard times come. And you're asked to give something up for him, and you're like, well, I didn't sign up for this. I, I came here for blessings. What's going on here? So yes, Jesus is our Savior, but he has to be our Lord. He has to be. Worshiping Jesus as Lord is not about all that you get from him. Worshiping Jesus as Lord is all you are willing to give up for him. It's also about giving up control. You'll give him anything he tells you to lose. You'll go wherever he tells you to go because he's your Lord. Romans 10.9, it's in here. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Savior, Lord, came first. He's got to be your master. And that's how we're going to stand. And the problem is, and for those of you who maybe you're new to the faith, or you're leaving religion and you're coming into a new refreshing faith, It's hard to weed out the weeds of what is being preached in America. Because in America, we have probably more of, I'm not going to say probably, I'm just going to say it. It's a savior only message. It's a savior only message without the Lordship. It's all about what we get from Him. Like, like Jesus is a vending machine. Forgiveness gifts, blessings, and the problem with it, and it's not undermining the cross, but that can make, we're already selfish, that's going to make us selfish, and we're only coming to him for blessings. It's selfish, making him Lord requires us to be selfless, and that's the whole point, by the end of this parable, you'll see that. Well, no, pastor, you're wrong. I'm standing on his promises, and I'm Claiming those blessings, and even perfect health maybe, and even wealth into my bank account, because my God has the cattle on a thousand, and my God will protect me from all pain and all suffering. Are you sure about that? You want to ask the apostles? Is that what Peter would agree with when he's hanging upside down being crucified? Or the Apostle Paul when he's about to be beheaded? No! This, this is not the message in here. 
We have to be ready for that because we're promised persecution and we're promised suffering. And it's a pipe dream to introduce you to Jesus only for what it does for you when you need to make him Lord. Why is James? James was executed by sword. Most of them were. That one's actually in the scripture. And then we have history for some of the other ones. And they're not sure. But yeah, they were ready to suffer. So why is there another gospel circulating that promises blessings without suffering? Well, here's why. The parable tells us. Because the enemy doesn't want you to have any root. So that you fall apart along with your um, testimony of what this kingdom message is that you, you're supposed to receive when you accept him as, as Lord and Savior. Here's the enemy's plan for you. And it's in Matthew 24, and I, don't, I think we're going to be there at some point, but Matthew 24, 10. He wants you to be part of the many who are going to fall away in the end times. The New Testament is clear. We are promised persecution. Rocky soil won't cut it. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Oh, Lord, it's so clear. When Jesus said that, do you, do you, have you ever thought about this? How did they see the cross at that time? Did they tie the cross to salvation? It hadn't happened yet. Thank God it did. But the only thing they saw in the cross was the Roman image of the cross. And that's tied to being a criminal and suffering and death. They're like, you want, you want us to t- take up a cross and follow you? They didn't, they didn't yet understand what we see it as. Praise the yes. Hallelujah, salvation, what he's done for us. But no, it's, it's a symbol of suffering. Suffering and salvation, interesting. Jesus is saying, you have to be really willing to lose your life for me, and you can only do that by making me Lord and Savior. There is no other way. Number three, worldly. Verse 22, as for what was sown among thorns... This is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So this is somebody who's actually hearing the word, and there's growth. There's root. That's good. But there's no fruit. Something else, actually, that, that, those thorns, those weeds, and I don't know much about weeds, but I know that they're annoying, because I don't want to pull them up. Um, and that's probably it, isn't it? I don't, want to, I don't need to get rid of those weeds. But something else is growing in the soil, and they're vicious weeds and thorns choking the life out. It's going to take the nutrients out. And the growth has been alongside other growth. So you're basically receiving the message. It's growing, but there's other things growing alongside it. So I would say that in this case, Christianity is just a life hack. It's an add-on. It's my life plus I'm going to add this Christian thing and we're just going to grow together. And there's a big problem with that because no fruit will be produced. The kingdom can't grow and produce if we forget to pluck out the weeds. This includes caring about worldly things, which Jesus has already talked about. Remember the worries? We're not supposed to worry. Don't be afraid. He said it over and over. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm going to take care of you. Even if you have to die, I'm going to take care of you. So why should we let the cares of a worldly system just keep us down? Why would we do that? We're all humans. We know why. Because we want to be in control of our own lives. And and letting go is hard for us. And in some way, we're all a little bit of a control freak. We, we want to keep some, we have to keep some part of our lives, right? I mean, when I, when I, when I come to Jesus, are you, I got to keep something from, I got to keep something, you know, whatever it is, you fill in the blank. You're, you want everything? That's hard. 
It's too risky to let go. There's comfort in the things we hold on to, but it's choking weeds and it prevents fruit. And here's what happens. You're, you're not satisfied in the end. Now, that could be a good thing if it's leading you to, in a way, but why even go there? You're not going to be satisfied because there's always somewhere where I know that I'm supposed to be more fruitful for the kingdom. And you've ignored all the weeds and you're trying to figure it out when it's right there in front of you. You're left unsatisfied. You know, I'll tell you, it's a satisfying Christian life even in, in, in the midst of the manifest stresses of this world and this life. It's still an awesome, it's an awesome thing. Something is missing. Wealth is tied to this real quickly, obviously, because money makes us feel secure, right? When we lose money, we panic. Oh, yes, we do. You can deny it, but even if you're, I mean, even if you're really mature, nobody likes having a zero on their bank account or a negative. So the more we earn, and this is Americans especially, the more we earn makes us feel secure. That can be dangerous. That's the danger of wealth. Not that it's, I mean, it leads to evil. I'm not saying the money is evil. We become, we just become accustomed to taking care of ourselves. And that's the whole problem with the church in, in Laodicea. And we're going to get in there Wednesday nights um, later on, I think next week. Because they thought they were rich, and Jesus is like, you're poor, and you're naked. You have all this riches and wealth. You become dependent, dependent on it because you have, you have money. They were self-sufficient. When the stock market plunges, people freak out. I don't because I don't understand it. But <laughs> I do understand when a, a carton of eggs is like $12 or whatever. I'm like, what? So um, thank God we have farmers who give us cheap eggs. Um, that is the world to freak out like that, not the kingdom. Wealth can deceive us, and also the wealth can misinterpret the blessings of God. Because we somehow, we equate blessing to having more stuff. Where does the Bible ever say that that's a reality? That you are blessed because you have more material wealth, and that means that you're blessed by God in the New Testament. The kingdom teaches the opposite. We're not supposed to love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And I'll move on for that one to number four, the best soil, the soil that we all want, and that's fruitful. The good soil. Verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. This one won't really take long because this is fairly, fairly simple. The good soil, those are the ones who have made Jesus Lord and Savior. They didn't rebel. They heard this message of radical life change in a different kingdom that Jesus is uh, presenting in the midst of crazy kingdoms. And still, it, it's happening here. It's, it's that clash of kingdoms. They were willing to lay it all down for him as Lord and then rejoice in what he's done at the cross. And when we do that, the outcome is this. The outcome is fruit for the kingdom. Not, not only, I mean, yeah, praise God, we have a new life and we have victory over Satan and, and temptation and, and all those things. But the fruit of the kingdom, it's not all about us anyway. It never was. It transforms us into servants to a Lord who was selfless and saw the needs of other people, and had compassion, and saw the least of these, and wanted to set people free, because it wasn't all about him. 
Desiring to see other people saved. 30, 60, 100 fold anything. So Jesus is not a, he's not only a spiritual blessing shower, I'll call it for us. And, and if I, I was thinking about it, the, the, any shower that came from the cross, it was blood and water. And, and to me, that's suffering and life abundantly. I know that's not what it means there. That's just what I'm, I'm using it as. When he's Lord and Savior, you have both. You have abundant life and you have suffering. And that's the whole point. When he's Lord and Savior, your priorities are sacrificed. Your time, time. Your comforts, your control. Your wealth, even your physical well-being, even your health. That's right. It, yeah. Even your security, whatever's in your bank account, anything. And that's why the message is hard to receive. It's still hard to receive today. And that's because we have to have ears to hear. And the reason... If we don't, if we're not hearing this message, it's because we're rebelling against him. It happened in the Old Testament. It still happens today, wherever this message is being preached. People harden their hearts. Oh, I remember when I hardened my heart. And Lord, help me never to do it again. I'm sure there's moments, right? But the only reason you back up and hard, right? The only reason you withdraw from a message that's like shocking to you It's because it's not what you want to hear, right? I don't want to hear this. Or it makes us uncomfortable. So here's what we can do. If it makes us uncomfortable, let's change the message. Let's make it more comfortable. And let's make it all about us. You're going to be blessed. He's going to protect you. You're going to be instantly healed. you got a check coming in the mail. I heard one preacher say... um, If they've diagnosed you with diabetes, just wake up in the morning and say, I'm blessed of the Lord. I don't have diabetes. It's not there. I'm like, what? Why don't you ask your Lord and and Master? Why don't you, you pray to the healer and trust in his authority to heal? And it's okay to ask him to heal. Rather than you taking it on yourself and buying into this blessing thing. Ladies and gentlemen, I... I won't preach it. Because I continue to walk through suffering every single week. Most of it, most of it, 75% to 85% is in the form of personal attacks and relational issues from other Christians. Naturally, that's because I'm in a position of leadership. But I also suffer the attacks in the physical. And that comes in the form of where my wife is suffering, or, you know, there's a, a, uh, something else going on. And we have to learn to walk through that while still believing in faith that God is all-powerful and realize when we did this, we made him Lord and Savior. He was never just a Savior to us. He was always Lord and Savior. The gospel is not what your sinful flesh wants to hear. It's not supposed to make you comfortable. Is that okay to say? It's not supposed to. You want to be comfortable? There's other gospels out there. Probably in this area. I don't know. It's not for me to say right now. So this morning, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Just close your eyes today. We're going to close recognizing what he did on the cross recognizing his sacrifice for us. But make no mistake about it. Yes, he died for you. Yes, in him you have new life, atonement, payment for your past uh, transgressions, taken care of, forgiveness. But it's also the Lord of the universe who came in flesh to die for you so that you could serve him as Lord and be willing to follow him and take up your cross and suffer for his name's sake, whatever that looks like. 
and in the midst of it all, you will have absolutely peace that surpasses understanding because it is without understanding that you should be any hope or have any joy in the midst of what's going on in your life right now. There's no other way to be okay while you're not okay. It is only through the promise that you have, the spiritual blessings that you have, the reality that nothing uh, will separate you from the love of God. Being aware of and secure in your salvation, knowing that he loves you and he's going to walk you through the fire or he'll take you right out of the fire. He could do anything and you're willing to obey his lordship. So this morning, before we even, this is serious, right? And you don't have to be a member of the church to take communion, I'll preface all that. But you have to, you have to be willing to make him lord and savior this morning. It's the lord part that leads to the greatest understanding of the savior part, and they go hand in hand. And it's both. It's not just one or the other. So this morning I speak to a, a pretty, pretty big group of people. With your eyes closed, your heads bowed. Maybe you know him as Savior today. Maybe somebody promised you something and you were in this all for you. Which I think at some point I've done this too. Early in my experience with Christians, right? And then I found out, man, I need to submit to this Lord. I need to make him Lord of my life or I'm not going to hold it together. This morning, if you've not made him Lord and Savior, and you'll say, you know what? I'm giving him control today. He's going to be my Lord and my Savior. I'm not just in it for me anymore. I'm not here waiting on a blessing and I'm not waiting on a check in the mail anymore. I will walk and follow you, Lord, no matter where you lead me, no matter what you ask me to give up. If it's hindering my walk with you for the kingdom and the glory of the kingdom, it's yours, Lord. I don't want it anymore. And for the very reason that I just called you Lord, if you will want to make him Lord today, just slip your hand up real quick. Come on. It's just me, me looking. Okay. Okay, put him down. I, I just, I scan, so I didn't really, don't, I want to, it's just, just, there's a response there, right? But then there's always the many who never raised their hands, and I'm aware of that because I used to be one of those people, and I hated when the preachers did this because it always embarrassed me. But we need to be uncomfortable sometimes. We need to take a step. So I'm going to, I'm praying, I'm praying. You can do the repeat after me thing. And we're going to come up here and we're going to partake of communion. Uh, no one's going to come serve you. We're going to, after I pray this prayer, just keep your heads down and eyes closed. Don't focus on me. We're going to partake of the blood and the body. And just come up, partake, and you, you can go pray. You can go talk to the Lord. You can dismiss and go fellowship, whatever it is. But this is a serious prayer. This is one that I'm not going to put in the Assemblies of God thing that they give me every year. It says, how many were saved in your services? I don't know, guys. How many, how many people made him Lord and Savior? I can't count that because it's in your heart, and the fruit is going to prove it. So if you'll make him Lord this morning and Savior, just repeat after me. Jesus Christ, I make you Lord and Savior. I need you, Lord. Thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for the price you paid. You are my master, and I serve you with my life. After you gave your life for me, thank you, Jesus. I recognize your lordship from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stand this morning. Come on. Come on, guys. Why don't, you, why don't we praise God? Like, just clap. Because there's people in here who made Jesus Lord and Savior today. That's awesome. And you know what? When stuff gets hard, you're not going to come back and be like, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. This isn't supposed to happen. You're going to be like, I'm ready.
I'm ready. I'm going to walk through this. And there's nothing else like it because real growth comes from that. And people are going to see your, they're going to see you. And the fruit comes from that, from your testimony. Just begin to line up.